Indeed, you're forced to acknowledge that, generally speaking, revivals are increasingly rare. And uh, long ago, a rather foolish but well-educated idiot wrote a book entitled Primitive Traits, a Revival. And in that book, he tried to prove that the reason why revivals are increasingly scarce is because the populace is becoming better educated and uh, no longer stirred by the raw emotionalism of revival. Well, Pastor Dan, I think we know where that fellow is. You've uh, spoken briefly about that. The education of people has had nothing to do with the diminishing of the frequency of revival. Something a whole lot more fundamental than that. Most of us have memorized 2 Chronicles 7, 14, and we can sing it and often do. Uh, some of you have preached upon it as I have with frequency, sometimes a single sermon, sometimes eight or ten sermons in a row on Second Chronicles 7, 14. But everything breaks down, really, in the first of the four things that we are called upon to do. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves. Not, that we're not willing to do. That has not happened. So what's the sense of talking about the rest? I'll tell you what's wrong with the prayer movement. The prayer movement is a prideful movement asking God to do what is guaranteed he will not do. He will not come and heal the land until the people of God humble themselves. And that's tough, really. What is more difficult than humbling yourself? And how do you know, even, whether you've made a speck of progress in this area? I've taken that to be a very serious word. I believe that God hates pride and he distances himself from the proud in heart. We are told in scripture that God holds the proud in heart at arm's length and it's wise once in a while at least to sit down and ask, how long is God's arm? And of course there is no answer. Because as God himself is infinite, so is his arm. We can just take it as a given that anyone who is proud in heart is held an infinite distance away from God. Personally, I haven't seen anything yet in all my travels and opportunities of ministry that indicates that we're even near the matter of revival. One of our brothers at the table tonight when we were eating together mentioned that in a conversation with Henry Blackaby, he, he had stated that uh, the next revival will begin in the prison and among business man. Curious kind of a thought. Last week on Wednesday I had lunch with one of the employees of the Awana movement. Perhaps your church has Awana group in it and uh, it's a good movement. Uh, but they have an unusual ministry that it appears that a lot of people haven't heard of. They've got the ministry uh, that has several parts to it, but one of the parts is called Malachi Dads. This is not well publicized, 
very little in truth known about it. But this dear fellow said to me for a very long time, the most dangerous place in America was Angola Prison in Louisiana, where there were practically daily murders taking place among the prisoners. Riots, time after time after time. Then they got a new warden who, reasoning things out, said, it's absurd to teach morality to people who don't know there's a God big enough to order them around. If this prison is going to change, it's got to come from the prisoners learning about the God of the Bible. And I was told just a few days ago, there are 5,000 prisoners at Angola, about 85% of whom are inmates for life with no possibility of parole. Out of that 5,000, 2,000 are in Bible studies together. I don't know any city in America that has 40% of its people studying the Bible every day. I don't know of any church that has 40% of its people in the Word of God. It's not far-fetched to suppose there is the possibility of revival beginning in prison. Now why? Those men are desperate. Are you desperate? Let me ask this row. Are you desperate for God? You don't look like it. <laughs> Is anybody here desperate for God? Recently, uh, Maggie and I took on an additional responsibility at a time we were sure we didn't need another responsibility because we weren't keeping up with the responsibilities we already had. But uh, our church lost its pastor, so they said, will you become interim pastor? Now you can imagine what the lousy interim pastor you've got when he's gone half the time. But nonetheless, we've done what we could. I made just about three conditions in accepting the responsibility, and one of them was the leadership team had to embrace the urgent necessity of turning the church into a house of prayer. And I made it crystal clear. That means every member of this church committed to pray together at least once a week in a serious corporate prayer meeting. Well, we're a long ways from achieving that. But we've reached maybe 40% or so now who are attending the prayer meeting. Now, the last Sunday we were there, I read to the group Psalm 107. Four times in Psalm 107, and seven. It talks about the situation getting so desperate. Let me, let me interrupt and say that's one of those historical psalms. 106 is a major historical psalm. 107 is also historical. Four times in the course of that psalm, it, it talks about the increase of difficulties, the tragic situation in which the people of God were finding themselves. And when it got bad enough, they cried unto the Lord. I don't hear that. Most of the places where I go, you can't even hear the prayer. Now, I remember, Maggie remembers, when our first child was born, we were living in an apartment. 
and there was an elderly man who owned the building and who lived right beneath us. And every time that baby opened his mouth, we were afraid that we would be put out. When a baby cries, everybody in the world almost seems to know that the baby's cry. Now, what kind of a cry is it that you got a hundred people in the room and 70% of the people who pray can't be heard? I experienced that this afternoon. Granted, I sat in the back, but this doesn't look like a very big room. We haven't learned how to cry. On every prayer meeting in our church, when I'm present, I have to plead with the people, please, please, speak your prayer so that it can be heard. I grant you, God can hear the unspoken prayer, but I can't. <laughs> and what's the sense of a prayer meeting where you can't participate because you haven't the foggiest notion what people are saying? Crying unto the Lord. It not only makes us aware of the velocity that is involved, but it certainly speaks of the urgency. When a child begins to wail, you can say to yourself, why, that child was just fed 45 minutes ago. I am not going to get up and feed it again. You've got to be a whole lot more resolute than any mother I ever knew <laughs> to let that child wail and wail and wail. But now, back to the prison. Why is it that 40% of the prisoners in the worst prison in the nation are crying unto God? I told you a huge percentage of them are lifers. They'll never get out. There's a desperation there, a brokenness that's still needed in us and in our praying together as well as in our own closets. But I've suggested that there's this critical problem of humility. You can't pray in a fashion that guarantees you're heard by God if there's no humility. And what does one do? Does one make a resolution? From now on, I am determined. From now on, I'm going to be humble. Well, I've done that a good many times. And it helps a little. <laughs> While you're remembering the resolution, doesn't take long to forget the resolution, but while you're remembering it, it helps. Then it finally dawned on me. Pride is maintained by comparison. So, big, hulky guy with muscles blossoming out of every portion of his body says, I got to feel good about myself. I know just what to do. Mr. Roberts is standing up front. I'll go stand next to him. <laughs> well, of course, you can find little runts like me everywhere. <laughs> and you can build your ego by comparison, the pretty girl likes to have around her some pretty plain <laughs> girls because she sure looks good in the midst of those wilted flowers. 
And of course, it does the ego of the plain girl good because she said, she's the most beautiful girl in our school and she likes me. But you think of it. We maintain and develop our pride by comparing ourselves with others. And no matter how wretched your circumstance, it's almost guaranteed that you can find somebody who looks worse than you do in at least some realms. And it gradually dawned on me, there's only one effective way to deal with pride and to bring at least a measure of humility into the life. And that's to stop comparing myself with my fellow humans and to allow only one comparison, myself and Christ. I'm not suggesting this is a little magic formula that automatically reduces you to humility because even though you've set your mind to compare yourself only with Christ, there'll be times when you'll find that little runt and stand next to it and feel puffed up. Now, this is particularly true in church life. I haven't spend, spent much of my life in the pastorate, most of my life. I've been an itinerant. But during the relatively few years I spent in the pastorate, I always felt it was important to attend whatever ministerial fellowships there were in the area, but I found it next to impossible to maintain any regular attendance. Those meetings were so disgusting to me. A man would say very modestly, well, we've had a very poor week. Honestly, I'm ashamed of what a poor week we had. Why, we only baptized 13 this week. And others would share his grief by saying, yes, yes, we sympathize with you. We're not doing very well ourselves. Only 18 baptisms this week. Oh, is that so? Well, we, we had a better than average week. We had 31 baptisms this week. And I'm sitting there saying, haven't seen a true convert for two months. Well, now, as it turned out, my one convert in two months proved to be a whole lot more enduring than their 35 or whatever. The church is always comparing itself with other churches and feeling good about themselves. And just as I've said about person to person, so no matter how lousy your church is, you can find one worse. And we have these brilliant, shining examples of these monstrous churches with thousands upon thousands in attendance to make us all feel wilted and as if we are failing the Lord. Uh, on the other hand, it is sadly true that uh, 20 sermons in one of those mega churches would not provide enough nourishment for a single sparrow, let alone a human being. And we all know that if you want the church to grow, don't say anything. The less said, the better, if you can just prance around and make believe. 
But if you preach the gospel, the crowd thins. I know some of these churches say running 20,000 in attendance each week. That would be down to 200 if they ever bore down on the word of God. But again, you see, now, now that gives us a wonderful grounds of comparison. Let's take this, dear brother. How many do you have here on an average Sunday? Seventy-five. Seventy-five. But of course, you're really preaching. Yeah, sure. So they got 10,000 over there, but they're just dinking around. We're serious here. Whatever direction you take it, you can build pride by comparison. So the exhortation is quit comparing yourself with others or with other churches. And let's get back to the biblical standard of Christ. Now, what I'd like to do this evening, I haven't started the sermon yet, just sort of <laughs> introducing the subject. I'd like to read a series of biblical passages, perhaps passages that you never strung together before. Let me return uh, to the book and uh, ask you then uh, to join me as we take a series of passages, one by one. And the first of these passages that I call to your attention is in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Just a brief portion from 1 Corinthians 6, starting at verse 9. 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Now, now, pay close attention. There's something quite remarkable, I believe, that appears as we take these passages uh, one after another. So, 1 Corinthians 6, at verse 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of our God. Now, well, that's a simple list of 12 types of sinners who cannot enter the kingdom of God. Let's go over them again just to try and fix them in our minds. The unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Don't be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexual, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers. Now then, I want you to stand as I call your particular profession. First, 
Let every fornicator stand. Well, then let every idolater stand. Well, then let the adulterers stand. Not much participation. Now, it gets more dangerous. Let the effeminate stand. Let the homo sexual stand. I think we're going to have to shout that a bit in our nation. No homosexual shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Isn't it remarkable to ordain a person to the ministry whom God has plainly declared cannot under any circumstance enter the kingdom of heaven. You, you see the point. We're, we're dealing here with those gross sins, sins of the flesh, the notorious sins. Now, I know a bit of timidity might have kept you from standing when your position was called, but I hope there was a greater reason why you didn't stand. I hope that you are not one of those just described. There are plenty of them in the churches across America. I hardly need to report to you that the statistics have clearly proven that the sin rate in the world is essentially no different than it is in the church. There are two areas that appear to be exceptions. Among those persons who call themselves born-again Christians who married and divorced and remarried, the rate is greater in the evangelical church than it is in the world. And the other areas in homosexuality, it is thought, I don't know that this is clearly demonstrated, it is thought that the percentage of those in the church who are homosexual, practicing homosexuals, is greater than in the world. A few of you know that, uh, among other responsibilities, Maggie and I um, own a rather large bookstore in Wheaton, Illinois. And uh, very often, uh, huge quantities of books come in, used books. And uh, a week or two ago, I was sorting through a pile of books, and I came across one by a very well-known evangelical writer, and I was particularly interested because a long time ago, Billy Graham, the evangelist, asked me to become his ghostwriter. I know it's a bit of a shock to some of you, but most of the prominent men in the church don't write the stuff that gets published under their name. Somebody else does. I've written just a wee bit for others, but uh, anyway, he offered me the job, but it was impossible to accept. But the man who ended up doing it wrote the book that I discovered in a pile a few days ago. His name is Mel White. He was, for years, a closet homosexual. Then he came out in the open and declared himself. And he has been trying to prove that homosexuality is acceptable to God. In his autobiography, page after page after page of distortion of biblical truth. Now, we just read it ever so plain. The effeminate and the homosexual shall not enter the kingdom of God. Now, I would like to hope that focusing for a few moments upon those ten awful sins made you feel good. That's not me. I'm not guilty of any of those. If you're not, this is truly an exceptional audience. 
Nonetheless, I'm going to hope that that's true. But now, a second passage that I ask you to turn to, out of Galatians chapter 5. The book of Galatians chapter 5. Picking up at verse 19, Galatians 5, 19. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, Sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outburst of, uh oh, now it's getting closer to home, outburst of anger. When was the last time you lost your temper? Disputes, dissensions, factions, envyings, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that they who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now let's turn desperately honest. Is not humility observed when one becomes desperately honest? When all sham and pretense is gone, when truth reigns, When I no longer pretend to be holy and admit what a rotten louse I am. So each of us, if we really are concerned about the glory of God and the well-being of the law, need to face verses of this sort. It's one thing to be able honestly to say, I am not an adulterer. I am not a fornicator. I am not a feminine. I am not a homosexual. But am I a creator of strife? Almost every church of my awareness has some people within it who are creators of strife. A high percentage of families have some agitator in them stirring up strife. Jealousy is prominent, outburst of anger, Seems like you can barely get through a week without some professed Christian blowing up. And again, let's not forget, the statements are clear. I forewarn you just as I have forewarned you that they who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, grace is involved, and we're not shutting off the kindness of God. We can be grateful that the word practice is included in the passage. Because every one of us would fall if it was a single occurrence that is being spoken of. 
But some of us who practice these things pretend that we don't. And we justify our position by saying such things as, well, if you think I've got a bad temper, you should have known my father. <laughs> and of course I respond, no, thank you. Knowing you is difficult enough. <laughs> but it's easy to throw stones at others. Old preachers lose their temper as well as young preachers. There is forgiveness, but these are pretty severe words, and words that are urgently needed if we are ever going to, be get, to get serious about humility. I mentioned the prisoners on death row. There's not a whisper of hope for them in this life. Their only hope is in the next life. So they are, thank God, turning in some measure at least to the grace of God. But if we take these passages seriously, any who practice these things, those who are regularly losing their temper, those who are frequently in dispute and stirring up strife, and uh, those uh, who are factious and who are envious, they're all in trouble, serious trouble. Another passage in Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians 5, picking it up at verse 3. Do not let immorality or any impurity or greed even be named among you as is proper among saints. There must be no filthiness and no silly talk. No coarse jesting. These things are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Now, if you didn't find yourself in the Galatians passage. You're sure to find at least something of yourself in the Ephesians passage. Covetous. I'd like everybody who has never, ever given way to covetousness to stand up and shout hallelujah to themselves. <laughs> no, I mean, we're, we're dealing with problems of immense consequence where so many of us are regularly falling before the God of this world. But now the three passages that we have read, all are earmarked by the fact that these lists say these persons guilty of these sins shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. But let's turn to another passage. This one in 2 Timothy. Second Timothy, please, at chapter 3. But realize this, that in the last days, difficult times 
will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips without self-control. Brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure, more or rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness. although they have denied its power. Avoid such men as these. Now, let's be literalist. Let's set our minds right now to avoid everybody who in any fashion is described in the 18 sins that Paul has just mentioned. If you avoid everyone guilty of these sins, who do you associate with? You can't even associate with yourself. (laughs) No, is this just fun and games? Is this just apostles getting paid to blast off for a lot of nonsense? Or is it the word of God? Now, the thing that concerns me, in those first three lists, we had a clear statement describing those who are not ever going to be subjects of the kingdom of God. Now, this particular statement is not along that line. I don't want to read something into the passage that isn't there. But what it plainly says is those who are guilty of these 18 sins, any or all of them, are under this grievous curse of knowing the form of of religion, but denying its power. I spoke earlier of a message given to a St. David Society long ago in Schenectady, New York, mocked by the mayor of the city on the question, why are revivals so rare. And it could be rephrased. Why is the church today doomed to live under the form of religion but denying its power? Isn't that really the nub of the situation that we're living in? We have tens of thousands of churches that have got the form in place. But there's no power. But frankly, I think it's even worse for an individual to have the form in place and yet to lack the power and then to attend revival prayer conferences and to do so time after time 
after time and nothing changes. Now let me lay out something that a few of you I know have thought of, but perhaps not all. In your mind, have you ever distinguished between sins that take you to hell and sins that rob God of his glory? Over the years, I've often used that incredible situation at the end of Moses' life. I want to make reference to it, but relatively briefly now. Do you, do you remember the incident? Do you remember what happened to Moses at the end of his life? There's nothing shameful about saying no. I mean, facts are facts. We either know or we don't know. But knowing is really quite consequential. Can be immensely helpful. Let me distinguish again. I've asked you, have you ever thought of the difference between sins that condemn one to hell? Sins like the three lists that we read, where it is absolutely stated those that are guilty of these things shall not enter the kingdom of God. And then I've asked you, on the other side, ha have you sensed the difference between sins that condemn to hell and sins that rob God of his glory? So let me recite briefly the details about Moses that uh, you may not have brought forward in your mind and ever thought seriously about them. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, there is a song that is, occupies the bulk of the chapter referred to as the song of Moses. But at the end of the song of Moses, Moses is exhorting the people to pay close attention, to heed, to practice what uh, they've been told. But then the Lord speaks out. And it uh, might be well to turn there because I don't want you to think I'm making this up. This is part of the sacred text, Deuteronomy chapter 32. Let your own eyes focus upon the words that are spoken here. As I said, the bulk of the chapter is occupied with the song. But at verse 48, so this is Deuteronomy 32 at verse 48. The Lord spoke to Moses that very same day, saying, Go up to this mountain of the Abarim, Mount Nebo, which is in the land of of Moab opposite Jericho and look at the land of Canaan which I am giving to the sons of Israel for a possession. Then die on the mountain where you ascend and be gathered to your people to Aaron your brother who died on Mount Hor and was gathered to his people because you broke faith with me in the midst of the sons of Israel at the waters of Meribah Kadesh in the wilderness of Zin because you did not treat me as holy in the midst of the sons of Israel. You shall see the land at a distance, but you shall not go there into the land which I'm giving to the sons of Israel. Now maybe you haven't thought seriously of the meaning of that. So let me ask you some 
simple question. When did God call Moses? A long time before. What did he call Moses to do? Come on now, you're adults, you're able to speak. Is that it? To lead them out of Egypt? Ah, yeah, don't leave out. To lead them to the promised land. Now he is being told, rise up on the mountain where you can look across and see the land of promise and lie down on that mountain and die. You'll never finish your life work, Moses. Now, you don't need to respond to this outwardly, but weigh this inwardly. Which is worse? To go to hell or to let the Lord down? and never finish your life work. Well, it depends on whether you're saved or not. I know an awful lot of people who think they're saved, and the, when they read this section, or Numbers 20 and all the passages that pertain, or when they hear me preach about it, their question, if only one question, Pastor, are you saying Moses went to hell? That's it. The answer, no, I'm not saying that. Didn't Moses appear at the Mount of Transfiguration? Oh, well, as long as he didn't go to hell, I don't care what else. But there is a reason why revivals are rare. And that reason is because the few people that call themselves Christians are focused upon escaping hell not upon the purpose for which they were created. You were not created to escape hell. Some of you Baptists may need to forgive an old man who was never a Baptist and in all likelihood will never be one who was indeed brought to faith in the Presbyterian Church and required as a youth to memorize the Westminster Standards and in particular the Shorter Catechism. And you ever hear of the Shorter Catechism of the Westminster? Oh, it's all right. Don't, I, I'm, I, I'm not beating on you. I, I just want you to listen. Will you promise me you'll listen? Well, I'm going to hold you to that now. The question in the catechism is asked, what is man's chief end? Yes, the answer, beautiful, to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Moses at the age of 120, now that's a bit older than me, <laughs> robbed God of his glory. And therefore was commanded, lie down on the mountain and die. Look across before you lie down and see where you were supposed to end up and realize that because you robbed me of my glory, I can't let you finish your life call. I said this already, but I've got to repeat it. If you're truly saved, It's an awful lot worse 
to rob God of his glory than to go to hell. No outward response, please. But how many of you feel deeply what I've just said? That your great burden is ever to bring glory to God and never to rob God of his glory. Now, every person described in 2 Timothy 3, in the verses that we read, every person who has the form of religion but denies its power is robbing God of his glory. Why is our nation growing worse with every passing week? Well, there are numerous factors that enter in, but the primary reason is because the church has so robbed God of his glory that the world thinks Christianity is ridiculous. That only idiots, those whose minds are addle-pated, those who are suffering from brain disorder, could ever believe anything as silly as Christianity. And frankly, if I didn't know any better, I would join them in their jeers. Because what I see in the church, by and large, is ridiculous nonsense. Now, what's the point of praying for revival if you haven't had a change of center in your life? If your interest in Christ is to escape hell, you haven't had a change of center in your life. You were born selfish. And you're still selfish if your interest in Christ is yourself. All who are truly born of God have a new center. The words of the Westminster Short Catechism are not just words, but they are the gripping passion of the life. I want to live to the glory of God so that I can enjoy him forever. And so that I can spend eternity shouting the praises of the Almighty. Now what possibility is there of any of us enjoying God when all we know of religion is the form? So what I'm trying to say is, you can look through that first three list and say, oh, well, I'm, I'm not perfect, but uh, I, I, I really don't practice these things. When I do any of these things, I'm grieved, I'm brokenhearted, I long for deliverance. But you can try to lead a holy life and desire deeply to lead a holy life and do so for purely selfish reasons. Well, you take someone like myself, I speak with care. My parents were truly converted when I was eight years of age. Their lives radically transformed. From that time on, that's 70 years, because I happen to be 78 at the moment, for 70 years, I have been exposed to the great truths of Christianity. I like what I read. I like what I've heard. Fortunately, in my case, I've not only been exposed to the truths through others, 
but experience them deeply in my own life. The thought of knowing nothing but the form of religion, the thought of not knowing the power is horrifying to me. I can't imagine anyone willing to drift along with the form and lack forever the power. And yet everywhere I look, that's exactly what I see. People who have the form. And over time, even the form gets messed up. And it looks less and less like the real thing. So when you don't have the power, you soon corrupt the form. But let's go back now to the Deuteronomy passage. Uh, now, I, for a moment, let me just speak a wee bit more about Moses. Uh, you've got your Bible in front of you. Most of you, a few of you, are breaking my heart because you don't seem to own a Bible, or, or at least nobody ever told you it would be good to bring it with you. But uh, I, I'm turning to Numbers 20. And... Uh, I, I just want to read a, a bit here. Numbers 20. There are five or six, really seven passages that deal with this subject of Moses and uh, what happened to him in the end. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, let me just give you a quick resume uh, of the situation. Verse 1 of chapter 20. Miriam died there. So... Moses is in a very difficult situation. He was in a team ministry with his sister Miriam and his brother Aaron, and his sister died. But God doesn't give out excuses and allow poor behavior because you've lost a loved one. Verse 2. There's another complication here. The people assembled together against Moses and Aaron. Now, you never were in a situation, Pastor, where the congregation did such a thing, were you? Never. never. Would to God it was true and would be always true. It's tough going when you're supposedly the pastor of a group of people that band together to give you an impossible time. These were rotten people, thoroughly full of themselves. They hated Moses and Aaron and loved them at the same time. So they militate together to provoke Moses. I, I, I don't want to spend the whole evening on this, but I, but I got a couple more things I've got to point out. Look at verse 6. Moses and Aaron came in from the presence of the assembly to the doorway of the tent of meeting. And they fell on their faces then the glory of the Lord appeared to them. Now, this young fellow is courageous. He, he never had a preacher step right up to him before and speak right in his face, so he's not quite sure how to handle it, but he's, he's doing fine. Were you ever in a situation where the presence of God was so real that you hardly knew how to behave? Then what did you do next? Uh, no. Nothing. Now in this case, Moses did something next. And what he did is what got him into such trouble. The Lord said to Moses, now the people are mad. They're congregated against Moses and Aaron, as I pointed out. Moses and Aaron had... Do you ever have an experience like Moses and Aaron? Where the Lord's presence was so powerful you fell down on your face? I spent a night or two in the 
Yeah. Yeah. Now what did you do next? Don't answer, brother. I don't want to incriminate you, make you <laughs> embarrassed. But to here, Moses and Aaron have had this incredible experience of the Lord appearing to them in the most magnificent way imaginable. And the Lord had said to Moses, these people have been murmuring about the lack of water. What I want you to do is to speak to the rock. And many of you know what he did instead. He lost his temper and he took the rod and he walloped the rock. Don't forget, the Lord said, speak to the rock. Now, once before, a similar thing happened, and that time the Lord said, take the rod and whack the rock. And water came out. This time, the Lord said, speak to the rock. But he whacked it, and water came out. The people got what they wanted. But Moses got what he didn't want. He allowed his anger to provoke him to the defiance of God. So look at verse 13. Those were the waters of Meribah. Because the sons of Israel contended with the Lord, and he proved himself holy among them. How did God prove himself holy among these cantankerous Israelites? God proved himself holy by saying, Moses, it was your responsibility to uphold my holiness. And you did not do so. Therefore, you forced me to uphold it. So I uphold it at your expense. Lie down on the mountain and die. Now friends, I believe that's what we're faced with in the American church right now. We're not upholding God's holiness before the people. But God is not going to allow his holiness to be dragged down by a silly and or corrupt church. How could God possibly send revival in righteousness to a contemptible mess like he has on his hands in the American church? He is not going to send revival until we humble ourselves. And so far, there's not much by way of encouragement in the church. Isn't it awful that an old man comes to speak to you on a Monday night and he says the only real evidence of God moving mightily is in the prison among those enduring a life sentence. Now with those sobering thoughts, let's go back to the Thessalonians passage. Excuse me, the Timothy passage. Second Timothy chapter three. Second Timothy three. Now realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. 
Now, I know that this is a mixed group with varying backgrounds, and we're not all from the same fellowship, and there are a variety of interpretations given even to such statements as last days. I, I may not be able to change your mind. I won't even attempt to do so. I'll simply tell you what I believe is meant when last days are described. There are two periods in Scripture, the early days and the latter days. And the dividing line is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Everything after the resurrection was the last days. Now, I concede that's not everybody's opinion. I'm just simply telling you what I believe to be absolute gospel truth. The church has been in the last days since its beginning. Now that there are later days in the last days, obviously, but the church throughout the centuries has believed itself to be living in the last days. Now we are seeing increasing signs that things are reaching a terminal point. For, for years, I maintained a very large personal library. Some of you have heard me say this. For a long time, I kept a section in the library of about 2,000 books that dealt alone solely with the subject of last days, what we call eschatology. And often when I was feeling kind of run down and worn out, I'd just have myself a little walk among these books and have a good laugh because the most absurd sort of nonsense has been published on the last days. I mean, virtually every naughty person in the world has been in some way described as Antichrist. <laughs> Napoleon, Mussolini, Hitler, William Jefferson Clinton, Barack Obama, etc. But in the last few months, I've begun to think that we might really be in the last of the last. I don't see anything at all that in, I, I want you to listen. Now you promised me you would. You don't know how long you're going to live, but let's suppose that you live uh, another, what is your age now? 19. Let's give this fella another 70 years. 89, will that be all right? And now, there's nothing final here, just a suggestion. <laughs> now, in 10 years, you're going to be living under a dictator. How does that sound? Appealing? You ever read about Nazi Germany? It's projected now that within 10 years, America will be like Nazi Germany. Does that sound good? No. No, but that's where we're headed. Every indication is that's the direction as a nation we've chosen. I don't think that's the will of God. And that's the will of those people who are content with a form of religion, but who deny its power. There's only one thing that can prevent that from happening, and that's the power of God. We're not here in order to feel a little better at the end of this period. We're here on behalf of a nation and a world that doesn't have the sense to discern what's happening. I'd like to hope that in some measure, every one of us who is here is aware of the fact that we are down now to one single hope.
we got a number of grandchildren. It was kind of hard for us to come away last Friday to start this series, first up in Pennsylvania, now down here, because the grandchildren were all there. We don't see much of them. But as I look the grandchildren over, this little four-year-old here, ranging up to 15, six in number. And I'm saying, what hope is there that these children will grow up in a Christian nation that treasures freedom? No hope. I don't see any hope. Not a bit of hope. Save in the power of true religion. But if we want the power of true religion, if we refuse to be content any longer with form, and we say from now on, nothing but reality, we're going to have to pay attention to the Second Timothy passage. So let's turn there again and, and uh, carefully look it over. Realize this, that in the last days, Difficult times will come for men. Now, I've said there are 18 things specified here. Number one, men will be lovers of self. Let's not allow any distortion of the truth in our own hearts. Who do you love most? I'm not asking you who are you supposed to love most, but who do you love most? Well, I meet all kinds of people that can't even say they love their wife more than themselves, or they love their children more than themselves. How can a man who has deserted his wife and children for another woman, dare to say, I love my children more than myself. No one in his right mind would choose an adulterous relationship if he loved others more than himself. Well, this is not merely a plague among the totally godless. This, as I pointed out, is a huge plague in the church. But let's be honest. How many here can honestly say, by God's grace, I do not love myself? Oh, you can't say that! Don't you know it's impossible to love others if you don't love yourself? That's what's being taught in most of the churches. You go into a so-called Christian bookstore, you'll see shelf after shelf after shelf of nonsense teaching you to love yourself first and foremost so that you can love others. No, 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 no. Let the liars publish all the trash they want. The truth of the matter is anyone who is a lover of self is doomed to the form of religion and uh, doomed to forever be denied its power. If we want revival, we're going to have to deal with that. Now, I don't think that one can take a list of 18 and uh, deal with every one of the 18 items in an evening. I think some of us are going to have to get really serious and say this is the Word of God. A, a lot of us can honestly say, personally, I don't know anything other than the form of religion. I have never known the power of God in my life. Oh, a little snatch here and a brief look there, but that's not what's being discussed here. This is talking about walking in the power of true 
religion. So set your heart to discern whether the love of self might not be a significant part of the absence of power of true religion in your life. Number two, lovers of money. Now that's a tough one. Some of us thought we were doing pretty good in rising above that one. Then our wonderful government has maneuvered and worked and uh, at a time when they promised us it would get better. I mean, what is the date today? Uh, have, it, have any of you gotten quarterly statements from the institutions that handle your... Mi you don't know anything about this, perhaps. <laughs> but but you, you see, I'm old. And, and it's a well-known fact, people don't live forever. And uh, the likelihood is there'll come a time when I won't be able to leave my bed. But I'll still have to pay bills, even if, if I'm a dying cripple. Most of us try to lay aside a little something. And that's wise, there's prudence in it. But when the quarterly statements came just after the 1st of July, Down another 14%. Already, we've lost almost everything, and now it's still being snatched away by these lovers of filthy lucre. We thought we had made some progress in conquering the love of money, but as the money disappears, and as you are facing possible bankruptcy or the loss of your home, then you begin to get a feel of how well you're doing in terms of conquering the love of money. I mean, this is pretty close to home right now. Isn't it an awful thing to realize that the love of money guarantees knowing nothing better than the form of religion. Surely we want to deal with that. Number three, boastful. I mentioned attending pastors meetings and men modestly saying, oh, we only baptized 13. I don't meet many people other than boasters. I find myself even sometimes doing that. If in counting something the number is nine, oh well it's easier to say ten. Or an even dozen. We're exaggerators. It's shocking how frequently we discover that we've stretched the truth a little, boasted in that quiet kind of a way, made it look as if things were other than they really are. Arrogant. Arrogant, word number four. Isn't it interesting that the first word of 2 Chronicles 7.14 in terms of what we must do is humility and the biggest focus in this list of 18 has to do with issues of pride. Boasters, that's an issue of pride. Arrogant, that's an issue of pride. Ungrateful, that's an issue of pride. Conceited, 
That's an issue of pride. Five out of the 18 touch on the issue of humility or the lack thereof. Now, I'll have to turn my back to my friends here uh, when I pick up this next section. Revilers. Disobedient to parents. I, I, I wouldn't want these young friends to feel that I was looking at them. How old are you when that issue of parents expires. I was in my 60s. My mother was living in Rochester, New York with a sister. And uh, I was going out to the car to get something. And my mother said to me, don't go out without putting on your jacket. <laughs> And I wanted to say, I have been on my own for 45 years. You don't need to tell me when to put on my jacket. <laughs> and then I remembered, children, obey your parents. Honor your father and your mother. So I bowed my heart and I said, Lord, I want to honor my mother. So enough grace came to say, thanks, Mom. But after all these years, you still care. We, 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 we're pretty late in life normally before we get beyond this issue of parents. Oh, obviously, some lose their parents when they're very young. But I don't wonder what some of you uh, still have parents alive. So revilers. Now, of course, the world is very good at this, reviling the church, making fun, mocking us, helping us to realize how stupid we are. But I find lots of revilers in the church. I find lots of people who, if there is a new convert that comes right out of the raw kind of sin, and some holy old saint will whisper to another holy old saint, don't worry, they'll be backslidden in no time. You know, when a new convert, a genuine new convert, is added to a church. It upsets the status quo. New converts do rile the waters. They've got such enthusiasm and love for Christ and commitment that everybody else is saying, sit down and shut up. Why do you have to embarrass us? There's a conspiracy to keep everything at the lowest possible level in the church instead of a divine conspiracy to lift everything to the highest possible. Is there a reviler in the group tonight? Are any of you in any fashion guilty of reviling? Then we've got the word ungrateful. How many times in the last month have you felt as if God wasn't fair to you? We, for a while, we ought to have Thanksgiving every week until we get the habit of praising the Lord. Uh, I honestly believe that the church across America could not be described as grateful, but ungrateful. And again, let's not forget, every one of these sins is explaining why we've got the form 
and not the power. Unholy. Now who would like to stand and testify that your life is marked by holiness? That everybody that knows you knows that you truly are holy. That ought to be the aspiration of every one of us. I mentioned my parents being converted when I was eight. And they took my brother and sisters and I to a church that had plaques, scripture plaques, all around the whole sanctuary. Often, those plaques had to do with holiness. And somehow, I can't attempt to explain this, somehow, as a child, it dawned on me that there is no beauty in all the world as glorious as the beauty of holiness. But can I boast and say, I have achieved it? Can you? Did anybody ever seriously describe you as holy? It's one thing to aspire to holiness. It's another thing to rise up to the provision of holiness that is in Christ. Amen. Our lack of holiness is dooming us to the form of religion and depriving us of the power. Unloving. Now, it's easy to see in the world how this is so. Maggie and I are members of a relatively small church. At the best, it was never more than 300. We've had, the two of us, a number of areas where we have an understanding, where we never really had an agreement. It's just that these things are understood. And do uh, you know what the word itinerant means? Itinerant? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, somebody who travels about. I'm what's called an itinerant preacher. Most of the time, it seems, I'm away from home. Maggie had this determination that when I was away from home preaching somewhere, she would never disturb me with the troubles that were occurring at home. She would handle them quietly herself. One day, I was preaching in the United Kingdom, and I called home. And I could tell by the tone of her voice something was dreadfully wrong. I, I said, Maggie, what's wrong? Oh, oh, I'll tell you about it when, I, when you get home. No, I said, now I'm alarmed. I, I've heard it in your voice. Now tell me, what is it? And she said, well, do you remember so-and-so? That is a family in our church. Yes, I said, of course. Were you aware that the daughter had been attending recently. Yes, I said, I was alert to that. She said, I know that you would know that she had three illegitimate children. Yes, I said, I know that. Did you know she was pregnant with the fourth illegitimate child? No, I said, I didn't know that. Well, she said uh, she was reaching term and uh, woman became very friendly with her and yesterday the woman came to the pregnant woman's home with two men they went into the kitchen and got the big butcher knife there were two children at home a third child was playing somewhere else that day they took the knife killed the two children. Then they slit this pregnant woman open 
took the baby and left. And there she is lying on the floor in a pool of blood. So they murdered three and carried away the infant that they extracted from the womb. Unloving. We read about things like that. Very shortly thereafter, you know, we live in the Chicago area. It's a terrible area. It is truly a wretched place. Sin abounds. We read in the newspaper a young girl who managed to hide her pregnancy was in her parents' apartment. The child was born. She opened the bathroom window and threw the child out the window. Someone passing by heard a wail. It was winter time. The child landed head down in a snowbank. I mean, in the clothing out of which she emerged from the womb, naked. And this woman was able to rescue the child from the snowbank. We, we know that we're living at a time when there's an incredible lack of love. But how can a person destroy their own church? which is happening every day. All around the country, persons who claim to be children of God, lovers of Jesus Christ, are smashing the church to pieces with their lack of love. Well, some of us aren't that vicious, but if we were to say, Holy Spirit, Will you point out to me every area in my life where I lack love? We might very well spend days weeping over what the Spirit of God showed us. Irreconcilable. Can't bring these warring parties together. Malicious gossips. Oh, we see so much tragedy that comes in the church from vicious tongues. Malicious gossip. My dear friends, it's quite clear, isn't it? What God wants of every one of us is to take this list of 18 things and say, Holy Spirit, Bring to the forefront of my mind and heart every violation of these 18 things. I'm sick and tired of the form of religion. I've got to know the power. I hate belonging to a church that knows nothing but form. I want to belong to a church that knows the power, but there's no danger of my church knowing the power while I'm in it. So I've got to deal with myself. Can't deal with anyone else until you've dealt with yourself. Without self-control, The Bible has a lot more to say about gluttony than it does drunkenness. Everywhere I go, I, I mean, I don't know how many times I've gone to a church where I've never been before, stepped out on the platform and gasped when I saw the number of grossly overweight people in the pew. And I've said to myself, within, now watch it, either the pastor or the pastor's wife will be grossly overweight. 
I cannot think of a single instance when that was not the case. The church inspires gross overweight. It's tolerant of it, but it encourages it. We have lack of self-control in realms of sex, in realms of eating, in realms of drinking, in addiction uh, to drugs, etc., etc. I mean, this is a colossal problem in the church, the lack of self-control. And again, you can shrug this off. It doesn't take 18 of these to sap you of power. Any violation at all that you tolerate dooms you to the life of form and prevents the power. Brutal. Brutal. What I've seen within the church, the brutality with which people treat one another and dear friend, especially the brutality with which they treat pastor. Well, I have not, as I said, I told you already, I haven't spent much of my life in the pastorate. But uh, we were in a pastor's in California, and uh, they were ganged up to destroy us. And uh, I heard somebody say, who is this pastor anyway? Is he here? Yeah, it's that little runt there. <laughs> well, we'll deal with him. And men did that. Vicious, brutal. Yeah, and you know how it is, especially among Baptists. Almost every Baptist church has at least three times as many members as they do attenders. And so whenever any issue gets hot, then those who haven't even seen the pastor show up to give him a royal treatment and to boost him clear across the city if they can. Brutality. And some of us have participated in that kind of wickedness. Haters of God. Now obviously, one of these points will strike you personally more strongly than another. But all 18 are to be weighed seriously. And again, we are to ask the Holy Spirit to show us What applies in our case? Treacherous. Think of all those persons betrayed by their spouse. Think of all those children betrayed by a parent. And sometimes by both parents. Reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. So you announce a church prayer meeting and you plead for every member to come. Not just a half a dozen, they'll come right up to you and say, oh, no possibility of my coming, my favorite team is on the television this afternoon. I was in a church in Colorado for a series of meetings at the time when one of their favorite teams was in a championship game, and the debate went right on in front of me. Shall we cancel the service, or shall we get the big screen television and put it in the lobby? They decided on the latter. So, at the beginning of the service, they said, any time you want, you just slip out to the lobby and see how your team is doing. Oh, I've been mentioning extremes, but it doesn't have to be extreme to fit. 
Is there any way in which you are a lover of pleasure more than a lover of God? Well, I've used up the time. I've distinguished between sins that take people straight to hell and sins that rob God of his glory. And the powerless Christian and the powerless church is a thief of God's glory. And the bulk of the world is convinced that Christianity is fraud because they know nothing but persons in the form of religion but deny its power. I believe it would be right before God to sit quietly and to say, I really am sick of the form. I really want to know the power. Show me everything in my life that is robbing me of your power. So let's spend the next half hour soberly asking God to show us who we really are. 